Good morning, everyone. Welcome to West Virginia University College of Law. Welcome faculty, students, staff, and special guests, particularly the special guests that have joined us today from Health Sciences and the Med School. We're delighted that you're here, and I'm delighted to see so many of you in the audience. It's a privilege to stand before you today to introduce the John W. Fisher II Lecture Series in Law and Medicine. Dr. Thomas S. Clark and his wife, Jean Clark, formerly of Morgantown and now residing in beautiful Brewston, West Virginia, generously established this series in 1998 with a half million dollar pledge to fund lectures in 10 fields of interest throughout the university. Let me tell you about Dr. Clark and Mrs. Clark. They're very special. Dr. Clark graduated from the WVU Medical Technology Program in 1967 and received his medical degree from WVU in 1975. He's the retired medical director of Mylan Pharmaceuticals and the former CEO and owner of Clinical Pharmacological Research Incorporated. Jean Clark completed her BA at WVU in 1967 and earned a master's degree in education in 1974. She continues her commitment to the university by serving on the WVU Foundation Board of Directors. The Clarks have two sons, Stuart of Nashville, Tennessee, and Chad, who resides in Morgantown. Of the 10 lectures throughout campus established by the Clarks, this one at the College of Law is very meaningful for two reasons. First, the Clarks actually focused this lecture series on law and medicine in the hope that it would build positive relationships between the medical and legal professions with the hope of promoting the discovery of commonalities and synergistic relationships between the professions to serve the public. Second, they established this uh, lecture series to honor their dear friend, John W. Fisher II, when he became the 15th dean of the WVU College of Law on April 12, 1998. In 2007, Dean Fisher was named the William J. Mayer Jr. Dean and Professor of Law, and he served as dean until 2008 when he became the William J. Mayer Jr. Emeritus Dean and Professor of Law. I want to take just a minute to tell you a little bit about Dean Fisher. Um, my, uh, he is my predecessor, as all of you know, and I served as his associate dean for many years. Um, but you may not know that he um, bleeds blue and gold, um, as does his wonderful wife, Susan. And um, he received his BA in history from WVU in 1964, his JD from the College of Law in 1967, he um, leapfrogged many others and joined the College of Law faculty in 1971, and he's been called by our state Supreme Court the state's foremost authority in the field of property law. I can attest to this um, by the fact that phone calls would come into his office while he was the dean with very complex rule against perpetuities questions. And I was always glad as the other property professor that the questions went to him. Um, in 1977, he received an appointment as a part-time magistrate for the U.S. District Court, um, earned uh, tenure at the College of Law. During the 80s, he served actually in the WVU administration as chief of staff um, and the advisor to the office of the president. Prior to his 1998 deanship, he fulfilled this leadership role of interim dean three times. Um, as I said, he's married to Susan Fisher. They have a daughter, Jennifer, who also works for the university in the president's office, and a son, Jay, and two grandchildren that they love very much, Austin and Emily. Um, I want to welcome you again to this lecture series, and I want to applaud the Clarks, who unfortunately have not arrived yet, um, to um, thank them for reaching out uh, to both of these professions and bringing us together over these very important issues. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Brandon Stump, and I am the Editor-in-Chief of the West Virginia Law Review. I would like to welcome you to the John W. Fisher II Lecture in Law and Medicine, 
which is being held in cooperation with the West Virginia Law Review. We on the West Virginia Law Review see today's lecture by Professor Carol Sanger as the perfect kickoff to a year-long discussion on health care in America. While much of the discussion on health care revolves around reform and hyperbole on 24-7 cable news networks, we on the West Virginia Law Review are pleased to announce that throughout the spring semester, the Law Review will present a lecture series entitled Beyond Politics, a Discussion on Healthcare in America. Our goal is to move beyond political rhetoric and examine public policy concerns regarding access to health care. Additionally, we will ask what right, if any, do citizens have to health care. In particular, the lecture series will highlight medical, legal, and social concerns regarding America's health care system and its relation to women and children, racial minorities, and the rural poor. For example, issues pertaining to the rural poor have a great impact on the citizens of West Virginia and many in the Appalachian region. According to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Resources, almost one in three adults living in rural America are also living in poor health. This is linked to the fact that many rural hospitals have closed and rural Americans often do not have transportation to go to hospitals and other communities, which is only compounded by the fact that many living in rural America also do not have health care. The lecture series will answer questions and raise just as many as to the equity of our current system in America. And for each disparity as discovered, we will begin to seek solutions. To learn more about our lecture series and to receive updates on our speakers, the dates, and times, I urge you all to visit our new website, which is brand new, which will be coming out next week. It's a really big deal. It's, uh, maybe I'm biased, but it's, it, it, which will be at wvlawreview.wvu.edu. The members of the West Virginia Law Review are passionate about these issues, and I guarantee that we will present a substantive and thought-provoking discussion on health care. I invite all of you to be a part of this dialogue on health care in America. I believe that we all have the social responsibility to examine disparities and inequalities in our system, to question their validity, and to seek a fairer world than the one that we inherited. I hope that you will join us. Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to um, our lecture today. I'm Professor Val Vidic, the Associate Dean for Faculty Research and Development, and it is my great pleasure and distinct honor this morning to introduce um, our speaker, Professor Carol Sanger. Professor Sanger currently holds the Barbara Ehrenstein Black Professor of Law Chair at Columbia University School of Law. She is a leading expert in the area of gender, the regulation of maternal health, family law, and law and society, uh, and in addition, contracts law. Uh, for those of you who are here from Professor Bowman's class, I'm sure you'll appreciate the relationship between law, uh, family law, and um, contracts law. Um, Professor Sanger received her Bachelor of Arts degree, Phi Beta Kappa, from Wellesley College and she received her JD cum laude from the University of Michigan. At Columbia, Professor Sanger teaches a wide range of courses from contracts to family law, children and the law, and more specifically courses that focus on the regulation of maternal health, reproduction, the regulation of abortion, and surrogacy, as well as overall the law's relationship to culture and society. One of the most fascinating classes um, that I've seen uh, in this area is a course that she co-teaches uh, with a history, the head of the history department at uh, Columbia, Meanings of Motherhood, a class which examines the legal and historical perspectives on motherhood. Professor Sanger is a prolific and prodigious scholar. Uh, her publications span seven pages uh, and are too numerous to cite individually. Um, but I'll try to highlight some of, of, of her um, illustrative uh, writings. She's the editor uh, with, of Cases and Materials on Contracts, along with the late E.A. Farnsworth and other professors. She has also edited recently a text called Family Law Stories, which is an anthology of commissioned essays 
on 12 significant family law cases, including Loving v. Virginia. She's also, along with Deborah Rohde, edited the book Gender and Rights. Her articles and essays have appeared in leading law journals, uh, such as the Harvard Journal on Law and Gender, the Columbia Law Review, the Georgetown Law Review, the University of Pennsylvania Law Review, and the University of Southern California Law Review, just to name a few. Her recent scholarship has focused on the regulation of maternal conduct, uh, the regulation of abortion and surrogacy. Uh, she's written on topics including teenage abortion and the legal regulation of that, judicial bypass hearings, uh, feminism and adoption, uh, and a multitude of other fascinating explorations of uh, the legal regulation of maternal health and the family. Um, the titles of some of her, of her articles I wanted to share with you just to give a flavor of, of the, um, the co complexity of what she's looking at. Uh, one of her recent pieces is entitled Compelling Narrative, Judicial Bypass Hearings and the Misuse of Law. Legal and Literary Portrayals of Absent Mothers is another one of her pieces. And I have to admit, my current personal favorite, uh, just because I just covered this topic in family law, Marriage as Business, the Problem of Investor Liability. Uh, Professor Sanger has been a visiting scholar for the Institute for Research on Women and Gender at Stanford Law School. In recognition of her outstanding research and scholarship, she has been awarded two extremely competitive and um, prestigious fellowships at both Oxford and at Princeton. Uh, she was named a Plummer Fellow at St. Anne's College at Oxford in 2008, and it, from 2003 to 4, she served as a Fellow in the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University on Law and Public Affairs. Uh, she's also visited at, at Stanford Law School and a number of other schools as well. She's currently a member on the executive board of the Institute for Research on Women and Gender. In addition to her uh, prolific scholarship and research, she's also an excellent and fabulous teacher. Uh, she was awarded the Columbia University Presidential Teaching Prize in 2001 uh, and has been also awarded the Willis Reese Teaching Prize uh, by the graduating class at Columbia Law School for 2007. Finally, I just wanted to touch briefly um, on the extent to which Professor Sanger is not only a writer, a scholar, a teacher, but she's also an active member in, in, this, in service. Um, she served as an elected trustee to the Law and Society Association, uh, which is uh, a group to which a uh, number of our faculty belong uh, that focuses on law, sociology, uh, cultural, and political studies. She served on several sections of the American Association of Law School uh, sections, including the section on interpretation, on contracts, on immigration law, and family law. In the summer, she teaches a summer school class to Thurgood Marshall interns, New York City high school students who aspire to law school. And most recently, she's, been, she's served as a guardian ad litem for foster children in New York City in a federal action challenging the removal of foster children from their placements. So uh, I wanted to wrap up by also saying, on top of all of those accomplishments, she is an extraordinary mentor and supportive uh, colleague and, and member of the legal community. Um, she works with a number of junior scholars, uh, women scholars. Um, I've certainly benefited a number of times from Professor Sanger's uh, mentorship and support. So with all of that, uh, I present to you Professor Carol Sanger. Oh, thank you, Val. I, now I know why I'm so tired. Um, uh, I wish my mother had been here to hear that. Uh, can't quite. Maybe she's, maybe she's listening to the broadcast. I really am very pleased to be here today and honored to have been asked to give the John W. Fisher second lecture in law and medicine. I am uh, grateful for the opportunity to present the, this work in, a, in such a rich interdisciplinary setting. And I am um, very amazed at what your law review intends to do. And, um, I'm proud to be part of not the website maybe, but the rest of it, which strikes me as a big deal. Uh, if that was the phrase that was used. Um, it's, it's perhaps especially fitting that Thomas Clark, who I think they haven't, haven't come yet, but and his wife, who've made, sponsored this series, graduated from 
WVU's program in medical technology um, because my subject today is about a particular technology and its influence not only within medicine but within politics, within the culture more broadly, uh, and within the lives of individual women. Um, the technology is obstetric ultrasound, and I'm interested in how ultrasound is used to permit or facilitate or require pregnant women to look at an image of their own fetus or embryo. And I'm especially interested in just what it is that women see when they look. Now, I want, I note, I want to say at the outset that in many ways this is a hard project to write or talk about. Abortion and fetuses and decisions about motherhood are subjects that are often deeply felt. Certainly we're all aware that there's ongoing uh, disagreement about abortion as a political matter. And at a personal level, too, decisions about pregnancy are often complicated, even when a decision one way or the other becomes clear. Women make um, d different decisions about pregnancy and motherhood uh, depending where they are in their own lives, so there's fluidity there as well. So this is simply to say that I recognize the complexity of abortion both as a personal decision and as the subject of regulation and political um, debate. And the only thing I take as a given in this lecture is abortion's legality. And my discussion proceeds with that fact, abortion is and has a legal medical procedure in place. Um, I want to say now that I welcome your comments both at the conclusion of this lecture and in the future as ideas or suggestions come to you, because part of my intent is to put this project under your skin so that you'll think about it and uh, as, as I do and, and, and be in touch as ideas come to you. And may I just ask, is it 45 minutes even now? That's fine. Yes, okay. Now, the lecture is organized in two parts. And I want to talk first about the use of ultrasound technology in the legal regulation of abortion. Twelve states now require, in addition, in addition to whatever other abortion regulations they may have in place, like waiting periods, um, 12 states now require that before a woman may consent to an abortion, she must, as part of the informed consent process, undergo an ultrasound and be offered a look at the resulting scan. Mandatory ultrasound is part of the, case, the state's case against abortion. The requirement is intended as visual proof that a fetus is, in the words of the South Dakota statute, a unique, separate, distinct living human being. And in the first part of this lecture, I want to think about why ultrasound may well bring about the result that the legislature intends for it to have. In the second part of the paper, I want to pose a different question, and I want to think about the actual effect for pregnant women of looking at an ultrasound rather than at its imagined or intended effect in the legislative account. That is, even if we come to understand in part one why it is that ultrasound may work to make fetus, fetus more baby-like and therefore to become an irresistible object of maternal affection or um, duty, I want to consider a wider range of responses by women to ultrasound images. What is it that women see when they look at an ultrasound scan? What is it that they see when they look at a scan knowing that they're planning to have an abortion? To answer that question, we'll have to ask more about the women, more about their circumstances, and more about the content of the scan. Uh, and in this lecture, I want to talk about ultrasound images within the context of family photographs generally and within the context of historical family photographs relating to death in particular. Uh, I'm going to suggest that looking at fetal images is a more nuanced proposition than may initially seem or than its proponents may imagine. Now, so first, ultras mandatory ultrasound. The case, the pro-life case for mandatory ultrasound is not hard to understand. The premise is that a woman who sees an image of her own fetus will be less likely to abort it. Couched in the protective terms of informed consent, until you see your baby, you really haven't got enough information to make a sound judgment about what you should do with your unwanted pregnancy. I want to ask just what is it that the patient is being informed about? I think first the image is meant to establish the state's proposition that the fetus is not just potential life, to use the Supreme Court's phrase from Roe, but actual life. Uh, but 
But mandatory ultrasound does more than identify life in general. Many states have requirements that women have to look at pictures, brochures, or sometimes videos of fetuses and fetal development. This is something different. An ultrasound scan informs women about a particular life, the one that's visible right there on the monitor. It's not just a life, it's a relative. So the statutes are meant to pr produce a visual confrontation, whether actual if the woman chooses to look, and some states, uh, Oklahoma now just passed one saying that the monitor must be faced towards, towards the woman. Um, or if not an actual confrontation, a notional one if she chooses not to look. Um, but the idea is that the pregnant woman should begin to, re abortion, re begin to regard abortion as an unthinkable decision. The confrontation is understood as prompting something like a conversion experience in an almost religious sense. As sociologist Faye Ginsburg has noted, the visible fetus is understand to reveal a certain truth, and as with the revelation of other truths, there's only one path to follow. Now, while there is no accurate data on the effect of seeing an ultrasound scan on abortion decisions, there is certainly anecdotal evidence, and much of it suggests that some women who undergo ultrasound believe they could never abort thereafter. To be sure, most of the information linking ultrasound to deciding against abortion comes from pro-life groups and clinics, so there may be some problem with selection bias in those accounts. But one cannot dismiss the power and attraction of fetus to many women. Most pregnant women, certainly those with welcomed pregnancies, anticipate and enjoy having an ultrasound or several during pregnancy. Now, if a woman is undecided about whether or not to continue her pregnancy, by what mechanisms might fetal imagery work, as the legislature, legislatures hope it does, to influence her decision? I'd like to suggest four, in addition to this idea of a conversion experience and that it's absolutely apparent. Uh, I think that they're more complex, they're better explanations. I want to suggest four. One is background familiarity with fetal imagery and fetal personality. The second are properties of photography itself, uh, particularly the power of visual medical technology. And the fourth is the meaning of ultrasound as a social rather than a medical experience. I won't say too much about familiarity with fetal imagery, except that I'm fairly confident everyone in here knows what a fetus looks like, whether from textbooks, movies, or advertisements. There was a really famous one by Volvo. It was just a big page that was an ultrasound with a tiny little Volvo at the bottom, and it said, is something inside telling you to buy a Volvo? Um, so following the routinization of ultrasound, almost everyone has seen, and many of us have admired, even if we're not quite sure what we're admiring, snapshots of a particular fetus or something we're told is a fetus, as happily expectant parents at work or at church or behind us in line at the Wawa share baby's first picture with the rest of us. Um, in fact, we know much more than what the fetus looks like. We know what it wants and how it feels. It wants to listen to Mozart in utero, despite the Disney recall. Um, it wants organic food, smoke-free environment. I'm giving those examples because the fetus has become more than a familiar image. It is now a presence in the culture, a patient, a consumer, a crime victim, and so on. The second mechanism that I think might make ultrasound work in this way, concerns the distinctive power of photography as a way of capturing experience. As Susan Sontag has explained, the virtually unlimited authority of images has replaced experience as the means of knowing something for sure. You know, you can't be sure you were on your vacation unless you took some pictures. Uh, you can tell people you went, you know, like, anyway. All right, so unlike a painting or a sketch, a photograph, says Sontag, is not only like its subject, but it is an extension of that subject. We have in a photograph surrogate possession of a cherished person or thing a possession which gives photographs some of the character of unique objects, which explains why we carry photographs of those we love near us. And I've, there's not time, but I've been looking at where people, where people carry photographs. I have a lovely article on New York policemen carrying them under their hats of their family. So we carry, that, this is part of why we carry the photograph. We have a piece of the person with us, even though we have 
only a piece of paper. So this is, this, and this is a special quality of family photos. Um, they capture what the family looks like, where it's been, how much fun it has. Um, they, they are part of what Sontag describes as an aesthetic consumerism to which everyone is now addicted, the need to have reality confirmed and experience enhanced by photographs. Thus, the wedding photo has become as much a part of the ceremony as the vows, and I would say the ultrasound, ultrasound scan launches the pregnancy. Um, third, ultrasound is special authority, not only because it's a form of visual technology, but visual medical technology. As others have explained, the cultural groundwork for the re receptivity to ultrasound was in place long before the procedure came into ordinary use in, uh, for ordinary pregnancies. Through familiarity with x-rays and television, representations on the screen were already accepted as part of the taken-for-granted world. Um, now, of course, to some extent, the take-it-for-granted world of ultrasound has uh, it works because if, when you have an ultrasound, you're sort of on a tour led by an able and encouraging guide. Um, the sonographer often interprets what is on the monitor for the woman, sometimes for the couple, pointing to perceptible body parts and organs and helping translate an image that might not be quite as adorable or comprehensible without the technician's commentary, especially at the early stages of pregnancy. And there's an extremely interesting literature, which I won't bear, I will, I will barely say anything about, about who goes into sonography and who wants to be a, an a obstetric sonographer as opposed to some other kind of um, um, technician. It's often people who want some patient contact that's available in other, in other fields. Um, there's also very interesting literature in the sonography uh, uh, jur journal about the ethics of technician-patient interaction and what um, technicians should or shouldn't say. In any event, what a woman sees when she looks at an ultrasound during the ultrasound might be more accurately, accurately thought of as assisted seeing. Um, this may be so even when the ultrasound is for purposes of uh, locating a pregnancy prior to abortion, as a recent uh, Oklahoma legislation requires that the physician point out identifiable identifiable body parts. Now, the fourth explanation for the potential of ultrasound to influence an abortion decision, I think, comes from the cultural meaning of the procedure. Here, visual qualities mix with social experience as we turn from the image to the process of image making. Once used primarily for di diagnostic purposes in obstetric care, in recent years the functions of ultrasound have expanded to include a sort of psychological bonding mechanism and I think perhaps a response uh, to consumer demand. Um, certainly with regard to wanted pregnancies, the screening is a much anticipated and near celebratory event. And we'll leave Tom Cruise out of it. Some of you may remember he had his own ultrasound machine in his basement so they could do it as much as they wanted. <laughs> Um, all right, so, but, you know, compare, compare having an ultrasound with, uh, you know, a mammogram or an x-ray. It's, it's not the same, uh, and you don't invite people usually to the latter two. All right, um, so it is, I, I, I think that an ultrasound has become something like a rite of passage into pregnancy, one of the first steps in ordinary prenatal care. Um, Formerly, the, one, one said you were with child when there was quickening or movement felt by the mother. That was the sensory proof that a baby existed. Now ultrasound operates as a sort of technological quickening, quickening working through visual rather than somatic sensations. So the sig social significance of ordinary prenatal ultrasound, I think, is crucial in comprehending the power and, in my view, the perversity of mandatory ultrasound. It is not just the screening, but the attendant activity, the hubbub, the passing around of photos, order ordering you know, your refrigerator magnets, um, that give the procedure its full meaning. Uh, and he this is, here, here we see the force of cultural practice. Mandatory ultrasound laws require women to participate physically in what has become a right of full-term pregnancy. Simply by virtue of having the screening at all, women are scooped into the social category of pregnant women, however brief they intend that status to be. In this way, mandatory ultrasound disrupts a woman, woman's control over her pregnancy, at least as far as the organization of her own attitudes. The effect of requiring ultrasound before an abortion is to do everything possible to shift the woman's thoughts, her experience, and her expectations from someone who has decided not to remain pregnant into the position of an ordinary mother-to-be. 
Once she's transformed into a mother or an expectant mother, a new and formidable set of expectations are imposed or evoked and are often assumed. Mandatory ultrasound solidifies the idea of a child so that the norms of maternal solicitude and protection take hold. That's the idea. And uh, the woman is pulled into the maternal fold by virtue of experiencing ultrasound, though under the entirely different circumstances of what she intends to be a temporary pregnancy. From an informed consent perspective, we see that what matters is not only the nature of the information, but who the law requires as the informant. Sometimes the law cares about the source of where you get your information. For example, in a number of states, minors uh, seeking to get judicial approval for an abortion must have obtained the medical information they have from an abortion and not from online sources and not from a Planned Parenthood counselor. So sometimes the law says to be informed, you must have learned it from a particular source. I think that ultrasound positions the fetus itself as the required source of information. In a way, the fetal image replaces the physician in whatever he or she might have to say. I mean, who are you going to believe about what's what, the doctor doing the abortion or this little guy up on the screen? Um, So this is all to say, um, as, as we suspected at the outset, that mandatory ultrasound statutes mean to transform the fetus or embryo from an abstraction into a baby in the eyes of its potentially aborting, potentially murderous mother. And in that last regard, I think there is a second purpose underlying the legislation. And I won't say much about this, but I think that underneath the the informed consent, um, mandatory ultrasound ensures or attempts to ensure that if the woman post-ultrasound still goes forward and aborts, she will feel as guilty about it as possible. Now, there are many other things that are wrong with with mandatory ultrasound that I think uh, are worth our attention. I want to move on to the question of law, so I'll only mention um, two. Um, First, unlike other compulsory forms of abortion disclosure, the statutes require women to use their own bodies to produce the very information intended to dissuade them from pursuing uh, an abortion. Um, for those of you who do criminal law, we have, you know, we have rules about when you can invade someone's body and what you can take out of it. Um, and uh, it's argued that this isn't a very invasive procedure. I don't know. You have to lie down, take off your clothes, take off your pants, you know, have stuff ripped, put, you know, put on you, have the wand go over you. And I will say that... Um, There's also, uh, in early abortion, uh, a tummy wand is not the preferred method, but a vaginal probe, a vaginal uh, wand. And when I uh, I was first working on this, I thought, I'm sure legislatures don't know that, that, you know, what they're requiring women to lie down and have something stuck into them. And uh, until I read the recent Oklahoma legislation, which specifies that a vaginal um, ultrasound might be the best method to see what's going on. So I thought, well, yes, they do mean that. Uh, To sort of uh, something you'd like to have the voters' opinions about, and there are lots of ways to think about why that medically certainly is a good idea, may may be a good idea. Um, Legislated, we might think otherwise about it. Um, Okay, so it's not just the use of ultrasound, but it's production that I think we should think of as coercive. Um, Second is that the resulting fetal image is intended as a self-evident statement about the meaning of human life. But characterizing the fetus as a child, as most ultrasound statutes do, is, because it is a statute, is uh, is a political description, not a scientific one. Uh, it confuses medically informed consent with what I identify as morally informed consent, which I take to be a realm of personal considerations that are a woman's alone to determine. Imbued with social meaning, the mandatory ultrasound requirement um, is less, uh, I would say, is less informed consent than veiled coercion, perhaps not about the ultimate decision, but about how a woman chooses to reach that decision. And if the decision itself is protected, as the right to have an abortion is, one might think that the path to reaching that decision might be protected from certain forms of intrusive regulation as well. 
Okay, so that's an overview of mandatory legislation and how it's meant to work and reasons why I think it might well work to create a, a connection between women and, and, um, and a fetus. But I want now to turn to the relation between ultrasound images and what I have called the visual construction of loss. And I want to say a little bit more about the word loss. For those who support mandatory ultrasound, an ultrasound scan is not a construction of loss. It's an image of life. Um, fetal imagery unveils the truth that to kill the living thing that is the fetus is, is, is a killing. Um, and in any event, to the extent that, what is ex that I'm describing something as a loss, uh, others would argue it's not a construction of loss, some sort of made up fancy pants language, you know, about social construction. Um, it's an actual factual depiction intended of what's going to happen, intended to save pregnant women from the inevitable and terrible suffering they will feel. So there would be a challenge to the idea that this is a visual construction of loss, I'm sure. But even accepting that the, the view, does looking at an ultrasound image work that way? I want to suggest that looking at an ultrasound is a much more complex phenomenon. In, and in doing so, um, we're going to end up distinguishing between wanted and unwanted pregnancies and the uh, unstable boundary between the two. Sometimes wanted pregnancies become unwanted, and sometimes it goes the other way, as the legislation hopes. And we have to figure out where the scan fits into this, into this borderland. Um, as I've said, wanted pregnancies have set the cultural norm for how women think about ultrasound generally. And there is certainly much to be said for the practice within obstetric care. It is generally a good thing for women and their partners to invest in a pregnancy at the earliest possible stage. And if ultrasound produces this kind of investment via a sort of visual bonding, there is something like a public health aspect to it that we should, that we should think is a good thing. Um, we, want, we want women to get prenatal care, and there's evidence that the ultrasound, uh, uh, perhaps in wanted pregnancies, um, um, encourages that. But we have to be very clear. Connection and joy are not universal responses to seeing the image of, images of one's fetus, even for women who, at least in the first instance, welcome their pregnancy. Some pregnancies become unwelcome precisely because the scan reveals one or another fetal anomaly. And I think we should also be clear, fetal anomalies are very much in the eye of the beholder. The disqualifying characteristic that may decide a woman to choose an abortion may be an, an encephaly, it may be a hair lip, it may be a potentially feminizing gene, or in many cultures, we don't have much on this on our own, we don't have information, simply seeing that the fetus is a girl. Um, so for mothers who learn during the screening that their baby is not as hoped, ultrasound becomes a complicated proposition. Um, in such cases, a woman may feel very differently about her fetus than she had the day before. Um, and we have a nice anal and we have an analogy from uh, prenatal, uh, prenatal diagnostic testing where there's a body of literature suggesting that women who have a prenatal test that reveals some possible um, problem and then must wait to have more testing uh, begin to defer, put their emotions on hold and have a sort of deferred investment in the pregnancy to see what the situation is going to be and to decide whether they're going to go forward or not. But what about women whose pregnancies are unwelcome from the start and not because of the characteristic of a particular fetus, but because the woman has thought through the consequences of this pregnancy, not this fetus, and has decided to abort? One possibility is that the sight of the image will cause her to change her mind. Another is that looking at the scan is something like a test of conviction. If you can abort after looking your fetus in the eye, maybe... You know, you've put yourself to some sort of test that we think uh, has, has met some sort of moral standard. Um, but but in, in any case, we should remember that um, in spite of all the reasons that women, women uh, that ultrasound might persuade women not to abort, over a million women in the United States continue to have abortions every year. 
Um, 60% of them are mothers or already have children. Um, so like one third of all women will have an abortion by the time they've reached, ended their reproductive uh, years. And this suggests that knowing what a fetus looks like at the time a decision is reached is not a complete deterrent to abortion. But that is not to say that seeing an, an ultrasound has no meaning for women who decide to abort. So how might sig fetal uh, imagery signify for them? Does the visual image cause women to think of themselves as murderers, as some pro-life advocates would argue is the only honest description? Do they think of themselves as mothers or as almost mothers in the same way that some women who have miscarriages may feel? Do women who abort grieve? Do they experience a sense of loss? These are the questions I want to look at uh, now uh, and, 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 and ask. The, the, the general question is, do women experience loss because of their visual engagement expectations or experiences of images? Um, and I want to get at this question by by providing a new image. A new, I'm going to give you a new scene. I'm changing the scene. So think about this, and I think it may sound familiar. Among the various traditions that accompany family gatherings, weddings, special birthdays, vacations, um, a familiar ritual, which is sometimes awkward and sometimes endearing, plays out at the moment when someone tries to organize the group photo. As everyone begins to take their places, you know, tall ones to the back, grandma in the middle, little kids line up in the front, um, there's often one person who stays seated. Cheerfully urged to, come on, get in the picture. The person remains seated, mumbling something along the lines of, oh no, I couldn't, I'm not in the family. And these professions of reluctance are usually followed by encouragement by some, particularly the one who brought her, and silence by others, the mother, uh, and, and, and the new girlfriend is typically pulled into the picture. She becomes, at least for the moment, a member of the family. The record recorded by the photograph may be more social than legal and more episodic than fixed. Nonetheless, the family has assembled itself, and everyone says, geez. Now, just as photos mark who is in the family at the time the picture is taken, they also serve to remind us at later points who is not. Things may not have worked out with a reluctant girlfriend, and her tentative temporary inclusion was in the end just that. Four years later, when the family album is brought back, brought out, the answer to the question, who's that, is not Jilly in the summer before she married Uncle Ted, but rather some girl from Baltimore. You know, it's like, all right. So her status as a member of the family becomes known or knowable only over time. We also know that people drop out of being in families. You know, the former son-in-law who no one ever liked now goes unmentioned, and Photoshop has helped make that actually, actually possible. <laughs> Um, there's also the problem of memory, which is intensified by the passage of time inherent in any photographic record and complicated by the ever-changing composition of the modern family. The answer to the question of who's that could be something like Maury's first wife's stepson, I think. Um, so, um, and in addition, family photographs are not always the best evidence of family membership. There are sometimes temporary absences, a child in the family or at college or simply estranged. Formal school photographs typically record such absences. The names of those missing on the day the group photo are, are taken are usually listed in a little bracket under the heading absent or sometimes not pictured. Um, so family photographs rarely come with those notations. It's up to the members of the family to keep their own record of who's in it and who's been in it. Um, so this is to say that family, um, looking at family photos over time is likely to have multiple meanings, even among members of the same family. Feeling towards a particular person uh, and therefore towards his or her photograph may change over time as love fades or deepens, guilt increases or wanes, and sorrow eases or endures. Traditionally, looking at family photographs has been, family photographs have offered only a record of the past. The future might be hinted at. The little kids in the front are supposed to get older. At a wedding, we know there's going to be a future. Um, but the idea of a record of the future was nonsensical. But as we've already seen, there's been a breakthrough of sorts in the chronolo chronological boundaries of the family through the ultrasound scan. Um, so we have a family member who exists before 
be before birth, and we aren't always certain that there will be a birth. So what is the meaning um, of this scan as a family photograph for a woman who's decided to abort? Is the subject of the scan like the girl from Baltimore who might, under a different set of circumstances, have become part of the family, but whose name and existence at some later point is hard to recall? Does the woman impose a mental not-pictured caption on every family photo for years to come, aware with each snap of the shutter that someone is missing? Or does the image not register as a family member at all, or not so very much, so that over time it sort of slips away? These questions are of interest, not simply as abstract propositions, because it's important to know how women receive uh, and experience pregnancy um, and, and how they, and, and in relation to how they decide whether or not to proceed towards parenthood. Now, um, I want to, to um, in thinking about this, I began, I, I began thinking, well, what do we know about how, what do we see when we look at pictures of the dead? And so I began doing research and found out that there were um, two rich historical traditions uh, involving pictures of, the, of, of dead people and especially dead children. And I want to say that I realized this aspect of my discussion, the visual dimensions of child death, linking them to abortion is very difficult to talk about. Even describing the project this way is fraught. To link abortion with the death of children, or even with the word death, is sometimes taken as an acknowledgment that abortion is murder and therefore an, a capitulation to the core argument against abortion. Nonetheless, I want to suggest that the possible experience of loss, including aspects of mourning, may not be incompatible with the underlying decision to abort. And they may not be incompatible at a personal level, and certainly not, they certainly don't answer the question of how abortion should be regulated at law. Um, okay, so let me just tell you about um, these two traditions, and, and, and I hope you can help me make more of them. Um, the first is called post mortem photography, and uh, in, in the mid 19th century, photography was a relatively new medium. I won't go into Matthew Brady and the Civil War, but uh, Drew Gilpin's Faust's new book, The Republic of Suffering, has a lot on the significance of photographs with relation to dead soldiers. Um, families commissioned portraits for special events, a wedding, a formal portrait of a soldier, and the death of a relative became such a special event, especially with children. A post-mortem photograph was the only likeness um, that the family may have had to remember the child by. So while I've been working, I've been, I've had this little photo um, up as a challenge to figure out what to make of it. Um, she, she's dead. Initially, the photo would actually be two inches high, which is something to remember. Um, children were often displayed in li as living in, established, in, in, more, in more established poses like this. Infants were often cradled in their parents' arms. There, if you're interested in this, there are two very good books. One is called Secure the Shadow, Death and Photography in America, and the other is called Sleeping Beauty. Um, uh, okay, now... In, in, in some communities, um, the tradition of formal post-mortem photography continued into the 20th century. Uh, for example, African-American studio photographer James Van Der Zee, who has a terrific book called Harlem Book of the Dead, has all the pictures that he took, many of children, many in arms. He adds angels around their heads, which is a, a sort of comforting thing, but they're the same, the same pictures of beautifully displayed children who've died. Um, but in general, Postmortem photography faded as cameras became more accessible, more popular. People had their own. It became cheaper to get a photo. So people would tend to have a picture of their living child, and that was what they would hold on to when the child died. In the last few decades, however, there's been a comeback of postmortem photography among the parents of stillborn children. Um, going beyond 19th century pictures of children who died, some modern parents now photograph and are urged to photograph children who never lived at all but were born dead. There are now special photographers in hospitals who are sensitive to the quality of the picture and they're less clinical. Um, um, the re so the, the uh, parents of stillborn children set up websites for friends and relatives to visit and are often um, showed cradling the baby themselves. 
The reconsideration of what counts as a child for purposes of mourning has been pushed back further to include miscarriages. Um, there's been a huge social shift in how we think about miscarriages. In the mid-20th century, if you had a miscarriage, you were supposed to you know, be grateful, not tell anybody, feel lucky that a bad one had been weeded out. Um, by the end of the 20th century, uh, it be, uh, miscarriage be, was recognized as um, an event as a death. It, was, uh, it had been elevated in a sense. It was something that could be acknowledged as an event for which grieving was appropriate and, and, and one could talk about it or beginning to be the case. And there's now a rich literature regarding the management of grief following stillbirths, neonatal deaths, and, and all forms of pregnancy loss, but not abortion uh, or miscarriage. So I just want to say a few things. I think I'm about so five minutes. Five or ten. Yes, they're leaving. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, I'll, I'll take the extra five, I think, just to. Um, so my question is, um, if our understanding of dead children can be plotted out on a spectrum of existence, from childhood death to postnatal to stillborn to miscarriage, can abortion be plotted on this spectrum, and is that a useful thing to do? Um, I, I think that it is. Um, um, and I want to suggest that there, um, to the extent a woman who has an abortion feels a loss, there is the general sense that she has no right to such feelings um, and certainly no right to go around talking about it or elicit sympathy from anybody. Her decision was voluntary. She knew what was there. She had the chance to see it. Um, in this respect, abortion loss becomes a form of what is known in social work as disenfranchised grief. The experience of loss by a person who does not have a socially recognized right, role, or capacity to grieve. So sometimes children are put in this category. Gay people are put in this category. You know, I mean, you mourn, you know, your lover. Uh, people with pets are put in this category. Don't mourn your pet. So it's a whole category of people who aren't allowed to grieve. Um, now, the concept of disenfranchised grief or loss can be colored by political considerations. Um, we know that the loss itself is often a matter of politics. Which bodies we mourn, who's, who's permitted to demonstrate grief or have their grief acknowledged, which memorials are built and which are suppressed. Um, so I want, I'll simply say that we want to think about grief itself as having political dimensions and the idea of loss as having political dimensions. Um, I'm jumping a little bit here. Okay. Does it feel like I'm jumping? <laughs> oh, all right. Um, I'm very close. Uh, all right. Uh, well, and the example that I was going to give of politicized visual loss, you remember under President Bush 43, um, there were pictures were not allowed to be taken of um, soldiers coming back in coffins. And they were not allowed to be split, displayed. I've never understood why the press went along with that. It's no longer the case. But for, for we had a long period of time when we were not supposed to see certain forms of death. Um, and that was not, and, and we can think about why that is, but I think it's a good example of how uh, the loss and visual representations of, of loss connected to grieving can be, can be politicized. Um, so I want to I'll summarize a few things. Yes, I have right here in my notes. Because I have about two more hours of things to say and about seven minutes left, let me summarize a bit about a few points about abortion and the visual construction. Seeing an ultrasound image may leave an indelible print, especially in cultures where we've been socialized in part to, um, um, to images, uh, to seeing fetal personality in images. The print may fade over time, or it may be re replaced by children yet to be born, or it may be replaced by children already around having their own pictures taken. But I think that the fact that an image exists does not yet appear to be determinative about how women decide about abortion. Now, um, I've just, I've just uh, this, this week come upon, well, I was just given this week uh, a set of uh, depositions from, a, from one of the late-term abortion cases that I hadn't known existed, and they're by doctors who did late-term abortions who explained why they sometimes did the more, uh, the, the, the procedure that's sometimes called um, partial birth abortion. 
uh, where, where the baby is delivered intact, but the brain is collapsed and the baby comes out at one. And the, the, the whole set of, um, of, of depositions where they explain that their patients who had a wanted child but for medical reasons decided that they had to abort wanted the baby to be born whole so that they could hold it and see it. And uh, I'm just quoting from a transcript. When they finally made a decision to have a termination, they are very troubled and feel very badly. They have mixed emotions and sometimes imagine the fetus is going to look terrible. And even when it does look terrible to the average person, when they actually see it, it's not as bad as they imagined it. And so it's helpful to let them see the fetus and to hold it. Some of them kiss it. And there's more description about how the staff tries to make it look a little better. Um, they have little gowns. We try to make the fetus look as untraumatized as possible and so on. They put a little bonnet over its head. If it's an anencephalic fetus, which means the top of the head is completely missing, they'll put a little bonnet on it. Um, so we have the case of people who, women who have decided to abort and for whom seeing the actual fetus is very important. I also, just on Monday, found another study from Canada, which is offering women, a hospital that's offering women who have early, early abortions, the, ask them whether they'd like to see the product of conception after the abortion. And a very, fairly large number say yes and report that they're glad that they did. Um, I'm only beginning to unpack that. Some of them say, I'm relieved because it was so small, or, huh, or that's what it looks like. But in any case, that's a whole new level of exploration, not an image, but the actual um, um, product of conception itself. These are, these are new areas that I'm looking in as I'm trying to see how what we see influences how we feel and um, uh, in ways that, um, that could be less politicized and that could be good for possibly for a patient. Um, let me just show you on the idea of seeing, I'm turning to one other picture. This is the second 19th century tradition which I knew nothing about. How many people do you see there? Okay, so this, this was called spirit photography. And it was, um, these were photos uh, uh, made by photographers who knew how to double expose plates and whose customers were more than satisfied to believe their child's, their dead child's spirit had entered the room. Spirit photography became very big actually in World War I where people just, uh, um, Arthur Conan Doyle and uh, Rudyard Kipling were two people who, believed, who lost sons and, and, and went for spirit photography. It's a whole interesting thing. So sometimes one sees and believes what one hopes to see. There's also a lovely spirit photo that Mary Lincoln had taken with Abe standing behind her, holding, putting his arms on her. Many pictures have the person standing behind because that's how you can you know, do the photo. Um, now, I have a quotation from a study of people going on, women undergoing fertility treatment, and this woman was shown a dish with the cells in it, and hoping, hoping, and she said, Sometimes she would squeeze her eyes, and if she really squinted, she could see life. I'm not so sure that that's a different experience from photo, from spirit photos. One sees what one wants to see, um, and perhaps, perhaps seeing, looking in a petri dish is, some, is more accurate in a biological sense than this. What I've tried to do, uh, just one more thing I want to leave you with. Um, in Japan, I've been thinking about this for a while, there are certain Japanese religious cults that um, provide um, what are called spirit gardens for the souls of aborted fetuses. And what one a woman has an abortion, she can buy a little shrine, it's like a little doll, and you put it in a little, very pleasant little garden um, and, and pay homage to it, um, some knit little clothes for it. Now, this is not a uniform practice. It's a complicated one. Westerners may, may misunderstand the ritual. Um, there's a very good book called Marketing the Menacing Fetus by Helen Hardacre that talks about this. Nonetheless, I think there's much to be said to permit some tangible recognition of loss by women. Um, and it's important to realize that the Japanese ritual, and lots of things are rituals in Japan that are very short, this is post-World War II, um, is against a background of common and legal abortion. So the idea is it doesn't have to be an admission of murder. One can sort of honor the soul, um, um, which I think if we thought about doing that here, I, I, I can't quite think, think about whether we think that's even possible. 
Um, I've tried to present a picture of the complexity of how death is photographed and how those photographic or ultrasonic images are given meaning by women. I've not figured out all the strands of how this goes together, although I think the historical examples uh, uh, and the examples from other culture, whether the use of ultrasound in India, where it's used regularly to, to get rid of female fetuses, or spirit statues in Japan, where, uh, where we have a, an actual tactile little statue rather than a picture. But they, these examples make us take a few paces back from present certainties. At present, the law has declared what a life is, what it looks like, and how it's looking 